Good morning, everyone. I'm Emily Actrazandi, Vice President of Atlantic Live, the team that brings the Atlantic's journalism to life on stages across the country. And we're so glad you are all here for civics and the future of democracy. I couldn't imagine a more timely conversation. Yesterday, Americans went to the polls and voted in elections across the country. The 2020 presidential campaign is in full swing, and the House of Representatives is engaged in an ongoing impeachment inquiry. This is a high-stakes moment, one that requires a shared understanding of our history and our Constitution. As John Adams said in 1765, liberty cannot be preserved without a general knowledge among the people. Yet many Americans don't have the skills or knowledge to make sense of it all. A recent survey from the Annenberg Policy Center found that only 40%, two out of five Americans, could name all three executive, or rather, branches of government. Almost everyone agrees that we need civics education, but that's where much agreement ends. What should we teach and who should decide? And these are some of the questions that will guide this morning's discussion. You'll hear from voices from inside the classroom and out, from K through 12 to higher education, and we'll even get to hear a perspective from a baseball fan. Bef and I should say, go Nats. <laughs> Before we get rolling, I want to thank our partners at the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins University for helping make this forum possible. We are incredibly grateful for their support. And over the course of the morning, we want everyone here to be a part of the conversation. We have lots of ways to do that. First, you can join the conversation on Twitter at Atlantic Live and use the hashtag Future of Civics. And we'll have time for your questions at the end of each session. And we thought we'd start with a friendly quiz, a way of warming up before we begin. So if everyone will indulge me, if you could take out your phones, and open a web browser. This isn't mandatory, but we do hope you'll play along. Um, once you have your phones out and have a web browser open, if you could type in slido.com, that's S-L-I-D-O dot com. Once again, slido.com, S-L-I-D-O dot com. Hopefully everyone's there. Um, Good, and next you're going to type in future of civics, one word. Again, future of civics, one word. And on your phone, you're going to notice two options at the top. Questions should be on the left and polls on the right. And we'll be using both features today throughout the program. But for now, I want everyone to tap on polls. And let's answer this question together. And your results are gonna show up on our screen. And here is one question that is actually taken from the US naturalization test. How many amendments does the US Constitution have? 18, 22, 27, or 31? And I see that most of you got the right answer which is 27, right? Some people changing their answer, I think. <laughs> um, and now, our second question. This isn't from the naturalization test. Should you have to know the answer to that question to become a US citizen? Yes or no? Fairly fairly interesting and strong response <laughs> as a no. And that's interesting and gets to the central tension about what citizens should know and what should be taught. And we're gonna use this technology throughout the day for your questions. Um, so you can submit them and our team will be monitoring them and um, sharing them with the moderators throughout the morning. And now let's turn to the topic that's on everyone's minds, the impeachment inquiry to talk to us about why this moment is a real life civics lesson and what we need to understand about it, please welcome to the stage the Atlantic's ideas editor and the author of our March cover story, A Case for Impeachment, Yoni Applebaum, 
Lawfare's executive editor, Susan Hennessy, and the editor-in-chief of Gallup News, Muhammad Yunus. And here to lead the conversation is journalist John Donovan. Take it away. Thank you, Emily. <clears throat> so um, impeachment seems to be in the news. Um, and what we wanted to do with this conversation this morning with an historian and a legal expert and an expert on uh, American public opinion is step back a little bit in the beginning and look at impeachment's legacy and see what we lessons and insights we draw from that and then return to the present moment and apply some of the insights that we've learned. So um, I want to start with you, Yoni, and, and just talk about this, this instrument that was built into the Constitution. Uh, only four presidents so far have faced a full-blown House inquiry. Uh, Andrew Johnson back in 1868, and then a hundred years go by, Richard Nixon, Bill Clinton, now Donald Trump. But I'm so interested in that, that empty century which, and and I, I, I'm old enough to have been around for, for Nixon's turn. And at the time, it seemed almost as though this tool that was being used had this, like it had been pulled out of the back of an attic with dust covering it, sort of like, like a, some sort of old weapon, like a battle axe or a saber, that, the, that it was problematically obsolete is almost how it felt. And now we're, you know, these 50 years later, it's been invoked seriously three times. But what, what was that? that long gap about? How was impeachment perceived? Yeah, we've actually got two long gaps there. One uh, from the time it's written into the Constitution uh, till Andrew Johnson, about 80 years, and then a second one of, a, of another century. Uh, and now we've done it um, three times within the lives of some of the people in this room. Um, it is, at both of those occasions, with Johnson and again with Nixon, treated as, as something of a, a constitutional oddity. Uh, although we are impeaching federal judges periodically in, in the interim, and that is the same mechanism, the same provision of the Constitution. So it's not as if uh, this goes wholly unused. Uh, both times, uh, with, with Nixon and with Johnson, what you're seeing is uh, a turn toward the Constitution to resolve a set of questions that, that are very difficult to, to adjudicate in any other way. Uh, the Constitution lays out impeachment as, as a particular process. Uh, the founders are probably, well, we know they're thinking about a, a, a fellow named Warren Hastings, who doesn't come up very often now, uh, but he was the British official in charge of India. Uh, he faced, if you think it's bad now, his impeachment ran for something like seven years. Uh, so this news cycle could get a lot worse. Uh, um, and, and they're thinking about impeachment as a mechanism for holding the person they've placed in charge of the republic in, in a really remarkably powerful position. The president has powers that the King of England hasn't exercised at that point in a century. And they're nervous about this. They're creating this incredibly powerful chief executive. And they want to be sure that if that official abuses his or her power in office, if that official uh, is subverting the system itself, there needs to be a corrective. And they talk about where that corrective should be. Should it be vested in the Supreme Court? Should it be uh, just the election that comes every four years? And what they conclude is, you want to put that power in the hands of the people's elected representatives. You want to split it as a safeguard so that the House of Representatives investigates and, and essentially indicts. That's what impeachment is. It's, it's functionally similar to an indictment. And then the Senate tries the case uh, with the Chief Justice of the United States presiding over that trial. And so they come up with this mechanism, uh, but it is a little bit set off to the side with, with a you know, break glass in case of emergency uh, instruction written on it. Uh, and for Unfortunately, we haven't had that many constitutional emergencies that have justified breaking the glass. Uh, but we shouldn't regard it as, and I think this is really key, the founders didn't regard it as a failure of the system. They didn't regard it as a calamity in its own right. Uh, instead, they regarded it as a necessary corrective. If you want to keep the system functioning properly, and, and Franklin says this, you, you don't want a, a tyrant to, to require assassination. You, you don't want to give people no recourse uh, for correcting something other than violence, revolution, and they're thinking about revolution, right? Um, you want to have a mechanism built into the system itself with safeguards and procedures and rules so that you have a rule-bound process for adjudicating a fundamental dispute uh, about whether or not the president is properly exercising his power. That's what impeachment is. And Susan, do, is there, has there been clarity on the rules? Because it seems that every time an impeachment process has gone to this extent of fullness, that part of the conversation is, well, what do we mean by 
a high crime and a misdemeanor. What, the part of the conversation begins not what did the person do wrong, that becomes part of it, but part of it is, well, what do we mean by uh, the, the sort of act or, or behavior that justifies using this tool? Yeah, so this is sort of a, that's something that comes up every single time, whether or not there needs to be essentially an indictable crime in order to, to have impeachment, to, to sort of qualify as that high crime and misdemeanor. Um, I think as a legal matter, uh, that's probably not correct. Um, so the scholar Charles Black once said, um, if the president were to decide to move to Saudi Arabia because he wanted to have multiple spouses and he was going to conduct the office by a correspondence course, or sort of by, by correspondence, um, the so long as his passport was in order, he wouldn't be committing a crime. That said, we can all understand that that would be such a breach of sort of his obligations to discharge his, his duty, to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. That would be impeachable. Now, the fundamental reality, of course, is that it's up to the House of Representatives to determine what is an impeachable offense, mm -hmm. what qualifies as a high crime and misdemeanor. And so it's, it's a little bit of sort of overlapping Venn diagrams. We understand that there is some criminal conduct that actually doesn't necessarily rise to the level of impeachment. Um, so pre-presidential criminal acts is something that sort of is a little bit of an, in a murky area. Is um, that off the table? Or do we? is it not even that clear cut? I, I don't think it's clear cut. I, I think that sort of falls into a gray area. That said, in the Clinton impeachment and, and uh, lack of conviction, the, the Congress essentially determined that sort of minor criminality related to, and I'm sort of using um, air quotes there, related to covering up personal indiscretions, that even, if, even among people who believed it was technically criminal, that wasn't impeachable. Um, and so, you know, we, we have sort of these, uh, these overlapping circles of, of what's going to fall into something that, that really is a sufficiently grave offense, an offense against the office. And I don't think it necessarily rests on this narrow question question of sort of it can some can somebody be indicted or not that said if you don't actually have criminal conduct it's going to be hard for for congress to make the case to the public about what exactly is wrong and and what exactly is the breach at issue and it's clear that it it, sh it cannot be about a particular policy for example if somebody is upset that the administration is separating families at the border and sees that as a terrible thing that's not grounds for impeachment or or is it could it be so as a technical matter, impeachable, impeachable grounds or whatever the House of Representatives decides are impeachable grounds. That said, I think whenever you look at sort of the history uh, you know, of how the impeachment clauses uh, were, were decided and how they've been used over time, impeachment is not supposed to be a remedy for sort of policy differences, right? So there's a reason we aren't seeing the House of Representatives or many people in the House of Representatives talking about family separations as being sort of grounds for impeachment. Lots of people feel very, very strongly about that on moral grounds. That said, that falls in the category of essentially policy disagreements. And so impeachment is supposed to be this extraordinary remedy that is, you know, is to be used when the president has sort of committed a crime against the Constitution, not just done something that, that you don't like as sort of a, a policy or, or legislative matter. What do you think is, is the public's most common misconception about impeachment? I don't know, and I, I guess we should sort of look at, at the polling on it. I, I think sort of the, the most common mis misperception is that um, the history of impeachment is everybody agrees on it, right? The impeachable offense comes out and, and it's clear cut and there's, it's really, really obvious. And so, so somehow um, Congress is breaking the rules, right? Or, or trying to, to apply this remedy to, to something that it's not supposed to be used for. Or there are procedural rules that the president is necessarily entitled to. Mm -hmm. you know, that's just not the case that you know, we ask our members of Congress, just like we ask the president, to swear this oath of office. And, and this decision about what is impeachment how to go about discharging this function, it, it really it returns to sort of the, the members of Congress's, uh, you know, discharging that oath, and, and, and it evolves quite a bit over time. And, and Yoni, there's just also the issue, I think, that uh, many, many folks might just think the word impeach means remove from office, and that, that it's actually a two-step process, and that um, uh, th two presidents have been impeached so far, and were not removed from office. So I think potentially there's that misconception as well. Yeah, I think people tend to think of impeachment as an outcome rather than a process. Uh, and, and we're moving toward the impeachment of a president in the House for the third time. Uh, the votes do appear to be there as of today. Um, and 
that does not mean, uh, as in the two previous instances where Congress has gone there, uh, that he will necessarily be removed after a trial in the Senate. I think that that also gets to the second part of this uh, in terms of public misperceptions. Many people think of this as essentially a criminal trial taking place in a different venue. Uh, and some of the president's defenders this time, as with uh, Clinton's defenders, as with Nixon's defenders, play up on that misperception. Uh, I saw uh, one senator who prides himself on his uh, fidelity to the Constitution citing the Sixth Amendment yesterday. Um, and I, I guess that I see things like that, and, and I hope that it's being done as an insincere partisan gambit, because it would be kind of terrifying if you believed it. Um, but, but in fact, what we have in, in the Congress is a very different kind of process that's laid out. It's an inherently political process. And what it's trying to adjudicate, right, it's, it's not just high crimes and misdemeanors, it's treason, bribery or high crimes and misdemeanors. And as Charles Black and others point out, if you put those three terms together, what they share, what the first two share in common, and presumably the third based on the, the statutory history at the time uh, shares as well, these are breaches of fiduciary trust, right? The, in, in the case of treason and bribery and really high crimes and misdemeanors, you're talking about a president who is not serving the best interests of the United States, who has put some other set of interests ahead of the national interest. And typically, though not always, that is where charges of impeachment have come down, that in some way the president is betraying his responsibility to the public. Uh, sometimes that can be out of a policy fight. Sometimes it can be out of a criminal deed. Uh, but the question of gravity really attends to that last part. Is it a fundamental betrayal of public trust? Mohammed, thank you for your patience. I was, I was waiting for the perfect moment to bring you into the conversation, and here we here are. It is. Here it is. All right. uh, the great thing about your organization is that they've been collecting data for a long, long time. So you're here to help us bridge the conversation we've been having about the general principles in the past to the present moment. Talk to us about the, the, we were talking ahead of time. You, you can tell us where the nation was on Nixon's impeachment and compare that to the present day. Yeah, um, uh, well, if Justin um, can put up the slide uh, with the table on it, we could all look at that together. Um, what's interesting is that unlike the Clinton impeachment and the support for it in public opinion, um, when you look at uh, Nixon's impeachment, you did see 58% of Americans uh, right, as, right before he resigned say that in fact he should be uh, removed from office. What's interesting now, of course, we're at 51% with President Trump. Uh, we started sort of in the mid 40s during the Mueller era uh, or the Mueller report days. Um, it jumped up to 52%. Um, and then uh, now we're back at 51%. The interesting comparison though between Nixon and now um, is that in uh, this case of Nixon, there was about a 40-point difference along partisan lines on whether or not people felt Nixon should be impeached. So it's actually 31% of Republicans at the time supported uh, Nixon's removal from office. Today, that 40-point divide has grown to an 80-point partisan divide. Um, and only 7% of Republicans uh, today think that uh, President Trump, for example, should be removed from office. So the partisan divide has really um, played itself out in the impeachment question. Of course, we all know that we're living in a very uh, divided uh, political world in America in terms of partisanship. But it is interesting to see um, how much worse it's gotten um, when you look at that. Of course, the partisan divide is also apparent when you look at presidential approval um, and a lot of other metrics. But that's really the big difference, I think, between then and now is that extra partisan spin to it. The other thing is just the political environment, I think, is different. We were talking about this in the back as well. Um, a lot of the rules and uh, laws that we just heard these brilliant people discuss are really based on a premise of refrainment on the part of uh, people in public office. So the notion that um, a president would sort of openly commit treason or openly say, I don't care that uh, you know, this is corrupt, wasn't expected. Um, I think we're entering a time now where we see that language kind of changing. I mean, when we see the chief of staff of the White House basically say, so what if there was a quid pro quo? Everybody in Washington is like that. It gets to the point where you know, it supports some of the data we have it shows where Americans do agree. So we're very divided when it comes to just about everything until you ask people about corruption in government. 78% of Americans today think corruption is widespread in government. Um, 
37% of Americans have confidence in the electoral process. In 2009, it was 59%. So not too long ago, a majority of Americans still had faith in the process. But what Americans, sadly, and uh, very interestingly in data, actually agree about are the ways in which the system is broken. Of course, the remedies um, are very different and proposed to be very different by, by the parties uh, in power or, or competing for power. But that notion that there is a, something very wrong with the system, um, that people are highly dissatisfied with the way things are going in the United States. The last time a majority of Americans were satisfied with the way things are going in the United States was 2005. So it's been quite a bipartisan story of frustration. You don't see the 70s and 80 percent these days and, until you ask those questions. And you were saying that the politicians who frustrate the public don't, aren't just Republicans but Democrats as well, that the, that the case of Hunter Biden exactly. is coming up as part of it. That's one of the things you're saying you're polling is showing people are actually upset about. Well, if, you, if you're one of those 78 percent of people, um, you know, is, is it uh, really believable? I mean, uh, Gallup, we're a rare animal in this town. We are staunchly neutral and nonpartisan, and we want to remain that way, and we always will. Um, but thinking about it, kind of putting your partisan hat away, when you think about the fact that eight out of 10 Americans say corruption is widespread in government, um, is the vice president's son having a, a financial arrangement in an industry he has no expertise in with a country that plays a critical role in US foreign policy, something that most people would see as sort of kosher? Um, I would argue probably not. Um, and that's why it's not 41% of people that say it's widespread. It's 78% of people that I'd, say corruption. I'd like to be able to bring some of your questions into the conversation. So I want to remind you, if you send them in using the app, we'll, I'll, I'll try to bring them in at the end. Um, but I, I want to turn to Susan with the, the table set, as Mohammed just did, of this, this overwhelming cynicism about the federal government, about the process. I and mean, the impeachment is operating at the federal level. And it would seem very, very easy for anyone to cast this procedure as essentially cynical in itself. And in fact, again, the record shows that the opposition party for most of the process leading up to an impeachment is in fact claiming that, that the process itself is illegitimate. Um, so g given what mom is just saying now about the, the public's loss of faith in uh, our leaders overall, what, what do the Democrats need to be careful about in presenting this case at all? Yeah, so I think um, the, f the core question here is what should and shouldn't be included in articles of impeachment. And there's a risk of being over-inclusive and there's a risk of being under-inclusive. So if we go back to sort of, you know, what is a common misperception about impeachment? I think one of the misperceptions is that an impeachment without removal is a failed impeachment somehow. I don't think that's the right way to look at it. Impeachment is itself uh, an important constraint on the presidency. It is the House of Representatives saying, Saying, this is impeachable conduct, whether or not uh, the Senate actually decides to remove somebody from office. And so as the House sort of is making their choice right now about what articles of impeachment to include, the narrowest being sort of just this, you know, specific issue with Ukraine uh, holding up military aid, the most broad being kind of a spaghetti at the wall approach, throw absolutely everything at it, even things like those, you know, policy, de policy decisions. Even in the middle of that, there are really hard questions. So we, we're talking about sort of ethics and, and corruption in government. Should there be an article of impeachment on things like violations of the emoluments clause? So we haven't seen prior presidents sort of refuse to di divest from their businesses. We haven't seen this kind of flagrant dare of saying, well, I'm gonna do whatever I can get away with that we're seeing in the current president. We're seeing that the judicial branch is fundamentally sort of doesn't move at a quick enough pace to be responsive to that. And so that really does leave the responsibility uh, you know, in the hands of Congress. And so on one hand, it might be tempting for members to say, well, we're going down this road of impeachment. We need to constrain the office. We need a way to sort of uh, express this. Let's just put in an article of impeachment on a violations of the emoluments clause. The problem there is that you're, because Congress hasn't used other remedies, they haven't passed laws or, or held hearings or sort of done things to, to use their ordinary tools to constrain those types of abuses, it is going to end up being perceived as sort of impeachment as an end run around the inability to mount a legislative coalition. And that's why Congress is going to need to be really, really thoughtful. So, so you would not include, if, again, you're not advising 
anybody in this, but if you were th hypothetically advising the Democrats in this, you would suggest not including the emoluments clause? Yes, yeah, so I, I wouldn't include things like the emoluments clause. I would include an article on lying to the American public. That was an important part of the articles of impeachment for both Nixon and Clinton. It's become something that we kind of shrug about right now. You know, it's not a crime to lie to the press. We heard the president say that. It's not a crime to lie to the New York Times. That's right, but it is it, it should be thought of as fundamentally unacceptable to lie to the American public. And when you lie to the press, that's what you're doing. You're lying to the American public. But how much lying, honestly? Because every... <laughs> Which president hasn't lied to the American public? Where's the bright, bright line? There? That's that's true. And so, uh, you know, sort of uh, any kind of presidential lie, anything that might fall within sort of the the uh, you know area of political spin, obviously those aren't things we're talking about. But whenever we're talking about sort of core, uh, you know, presidential conduct and and the kinds of things that the president has lied about in this instance, it, it then becomes you know I, I think more difficult uh, you know to to turn a blind eye to that stuff because anything that is and included here is essentially being ratified as not rising to the level of impeachment. And I think we have to think about the ramifications for the office in the long term. I just wanted to add, this is such a good point about the New York Times or, or any press. Um, again, a comparison to Nixon to now, we're at a low point in people's trust in the honesty and uh, you know just straightforwardness of news. So media organizations in this country are actually facing a co confidence crisis. 40% uh, of Americans now say that the news that they receive is sort of honest and fair and unbiased, et cetera. Um, during the time of Nixon, it was like much closer to 70s, high 70%. So even that notion of like, who are the American people and who's lying to whom, you see how these perceptions can really change the public conversation at least um, around whether something like that is impeachable. Is it from the perspective of the president's base? Is the New York Times really the American people? Um, and, it, and are they lying to the American people? Th these questions were not as, I think, um, uh, aggressively debated in the era of Nixon. There was kind of an understanding that the press was the press and their job is to report um, and hold leaders accountable. And I think, you know, we've come to an era now, particularly in news, political news content, um, where it's just a very different world and it creates openings to undermine what is a very legitimate legal point that you make, which is you are misleading the public that you're you elected to. You know, I want to go back to the question about, about the process appearing legitimate. Yeah. Ha has its legitimacy always been attacked uh, as the process is unfolding? And is that an issue that we need to be concerned about? Always and invariably, and yes, we should be concerned. So it's, it's a recurrent problem. You know, I think that, that if you want a precedent for what we're seeing right now, the right place to look isn't Nixon, it's, it's Andrew Johnson, uh, the, the president who succeeds Lincoln in office. Um, you know, we're in a highly partisan time. They had just emerged from a civil war that had claimed three quarters of a million lives. Um, that, was, that was pretty polarized. Uh, and they had an avowedly partisan press, not just a, a press which some people thought suspiciously was part, but, but papers that were Democratic papers or Republican papers. That was how the press worked. Um, and so you had a real information problem too. Uh, What's interesting is that Congress has gone here three times. Um, Johnson tries and, and fails to even secure the presidential nomination uh, after his uh, impeachment doesn't result in his removal in the Senate. Uh, Nixon resigns, gives way to Ford, who's his to Carter. Uh, Clinton uh, is term limited out and, and Gore runs after the largest economic expansion post-war uh, and, and gets beaten by George W. Bush. Uh, I, I think that although partisanship is, uh, is a dangerous force in our own time, and there's certainly the, the attacks on legitimacy of the process are, are worrying. Uh, impeachment can work in a variety of ways. It, it is Congress's way, the House's way, at least, of, of drawing a line and saying, if you cross this line in office, if you break these norms, here is our enforcement mechanism. We're going to drag you into a trial in front of the Senate. You're going to have to defend your own conduct. Uh, it will do lasting political damage to yourself, your legacy, your party. Don't do that. Uh, and, and that is a message which most presidents uh, have taken to heart. Uh, and so one reason why we have the 100 years after Johnson is Johnson tried to defy Congress. Johnson tried to direct reconstruction, uh, in his phrase, uh, to, to create a white man's government in a, in a white man's republic. And Congress told him to cut that out and amended the Constitution to cut it out and passed laws to cut it out. And Johnson repeatedly defied it. Uh, and, and Congress slapped him down. And after that, 
uh, you go 100 years without another impeachment, in part because presidents got the message. Uh, if Congress is passing laws and asking you to faithfully execute them, you can't just blow off Congress. It will act. Uh, and so whether or not uh, an impeachment results in removal uh, is not always the most salient question. But what if you're a president who never flinches? Never. No matter what you're found doing or have been accused of. Never. You haven't blinked once. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Does, does impeachment act as that corrective on behavior, do you think? Well, I, you know, Johnson was that guy. He's out he there in the middle of impeachment threatening to lynch the leader of the opposition um, with, you know, at, at campaign rallies, which no sitting president has had before. He was a norm-shattering, uh, uh, uncouth outsider who, who said things that, that others simply had not said and, and persistently broke laws in the way that previous presidents had not broken them. Uh, and he did not flinch in the face of impeachment. Uh, he tried to fight it. He may have, in fact, bribed his way out of it. It's a little unclear. Uh, um, but even so, it was a warning not just to him but to his successors. The Nixon Presidential Library is a wonderful series of oral histories. Uh, and they went and they interviewed lots of Republican members of, of the House, of the Senate, and, and said, what, what made you turn? What made you decide uh, not to support Nixon? And, and uh, the recurrent theme I find in those interviews is not that they suddenly decided that, that Richard Richard Nixon was a really bad guy who had to go. They thought forward. They, they imagined what would happen if they did not act. They imagined a Democratic president coming in and behaving precisely as Richard Nixon was then behaving. And, and that was what they couldn't countenance. Not Nixon's own behavior in, in pursuit of ends that they largely shared, but rather the behavior, the misbehavior of a president, uh, which if they left unchecked, would encourage his successors, who might not share their partisan views or policy views, to act in precisely the same way. And, and that, I think, to the extent that there is hope for anything to transcend partisanship at this moment, it would be craven partisan self-interest. It would be Republican members of the House and Senate looking at what President Trump is doing. Imagine President Warren doing exactly these things in furtherance of her own policy agenda and deciding that maybe this is a good place to draw the line. Sarah, we have a question from the audience. Do you think the polarization of our time is permanent? It's not an easy question, but what do you think? I don't know, right? This isn't sort sure. of polarization is not necessarily my field. I would say, though, this is a an area in which we really need Congress to act despite polarization, and we need them to ignore the polls a little bit here and decide, you know, this this really core question of how, what is, uh, you know, a, a faithful execution of the office of a, of a presidency. Is it okay for the president of the United States to pick up the phone and ask for an investigation of an American citizen in violation of that? American citizens' constitutional rights, their rights to due process, right? The, the, these sort of, uh, you know, important, very, very richly layered normative constraints we're seen in the, we've seen in the domestic context. Is it okay for a president to do an end run by essentially going to use a foreign law enforcement apparatus? Is it okay for the president of the United States to use congressionally appropriated aid to effectively extort a foreign leader into becoming an opposition researcher? Those are really, really important questions. And one thing we've seen over the history of the American presidency is this is not a static office. It's an office that, ex that changes a lot over time. It's an office of people testing the boundaries and either getting away with it or not getting away with it. And so once again, we are at this really, really critical moment where we have to ask ourselves not just, you know, what will Donald Trump's polling look like, you know, in November, but really what, what is the purpose and nature the American presidency, and, and what happens if the, the ultimate decision here is, is to say, we've seen this conduct, we've seen what the White House itself has an, acknowledged and admitted to, we've determined that, that that's ex essentially acceptable. You know, what will be the long-term consequences? Another question, what role does the, pless, uh, does the press play in impeachment? Um, have you given any thoughts to that? I actually wanted to answer that question on the floor. <laughs> since you said... So you know, do that. Uh, I think that um, I'm not so uh, pessimistic on that, and here's why. Um, America's pendulum swings pretty dramatically. Um, we went from George W. Bush to Barack Obama to Donald Trump. Um, I think what you saw happen in the last election in both the Republican and Democratic Party is a real crisis of what is this party who are on both sides? Who are we? Why is Bernie Sanders challenging the leader of our party? 
why is a guy getting uh, attention for putting Lindsey Graham's phone number on the internet and calling everybody in his party stupid? Um, that's a really clear picture that those folks have realized people are kind of fed up with the partisanship. I think if you, we need to watch a couple more election cycles to really see whether or not this is kind of our new normal. So the impeachment story is definitely to be continued. And I want to thank all of you for coming here this morning. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>talk about what's missing from civics, please welcome Louise Dubé, the executive director of iCivics, Jessica Marshall, a doctoral student at Northwestern University's School of Education and Social Policy, and Shalina Warren, a teacher at Washington's Dunbar High School. Here to lead the conversation is Atlantic staff writer Aliyah Wong. Good morning, everyone. Uh, now that we've had a very lighthearted conversation to start off the morning, uh, we're going to, you know, have a very a much more serious conversation now. Uh, for starters, I want to I want you, Louise, to explain the iCivics curriculum. I think it's a really, obviously, the most uh, prominent civics uh, uh, education uh, source of education materials in this country. Uh, but maybe you can give us some context as far as what the civics education landscape looks like right now. Great. Uh, so iCivics uh, teaches about 7 million kids this year. Um, so we teach more than half of the students in our country. Um, and this is all over in all 50 states. And that is really kind of uh, a very difficult task because in all 50 states, there are different standards and different things that students are learning. So a lot of people ask me, you know, what are they learning? So they're learning about our constitution, they're learning about our history, they're learning about the rules of how it works, and they're learning a little bit about their state, and they're sometimes doing service in the community. So that's basically uh, what civics is. Over about... Uh, many, many decades we've seen a deterioration of how much civics there is taught and how in-depth it is being taught. And w as a result, we've lost the capacity to do a whole lot more. We're really trying to change that. Uh, we have uh, action in many states, uh, particularly in Massachusetts recently, where we passed legislation uh, to ensure that every student in uh, uh, Massachusetts will get a full grade eight civics course and is required to do two projects, a civics project before uh, they graduate from high school. So um, there are a lot of positive signs about how much more can happen. Uh, at iCivics, we use games uh, and online games to engage students. So they decide the result of the next election uh, by being the, pr the candidate for election. That is what creates the relevance for students. Uh, we are now in a digital democracy really important for us as adults to try to lay out a path for how to engage in a digital democracy. Awesome. And, and when was it that sort of civics education started to experience this downturn? I think it was, um, so uh, if, you, if you look at the research, roughly during the years where uh, we started as a population to have um, less trust in our government. So during the 60s, 70s, you could see a gradual deterioration of the amount and the depth and the importance of civic education. Sometimes uh, you have a requirement on the books in some states, but nobody takes it seriously. It's not assessed, it's not, um, it's not provided resources. If you look at the total amount of what is being spent in civics compared to other disciplines, it's a rounding error. Mm -hmm. and, and we were just talking, you said that the demand for iCivics has, has skyrocketed in the last Exploding, year. I would say, yes. So the momentum for civics in general, uh, the demand for iCivics itself, uh, we're up 30% in many cases this year. Uh, so I would say that a classroom is just like what happens in real life, right? There is no difference. When kids see what they see in the political sphere, in the environment, on, the, uh, on YouTube and wherever, they want to know about it and they come in with those requirements and requests of their educators. Right. So Shalina, you actually developed a curriculum and have taught this curriculum that actually does bring civics to life for kids. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, so um, in my class, I try to 
give students a voice. I um, use advocacy in my classroom. For instance, with um, last year, I had a student voice committee in my class um, as like a student governance opportunity. And during this time, my students polled the staff and the students. I teach at the first African-American high school in DC. Um, and in America, we started in 1870. We have a rich legacy of um, alumni and staff um, that um, paved the way for our students. But unfortunately, there's a disconnect. My students didn't know uh, much about our legacy of the school. So one of the issues, which was a very top issue from last year was that um, the students don't know the history. Not only the students, but the teachers as well. So um, we decided to come up with an action civics project to try to incorporate um, learning about history in our school. And fast forward to this month, now we have Dunbar History Month designated as November. So throughout this whole month at my school, we are celebrating and learning more about our history from students, faculty, and staff. So just little things like that can actually make a difference in showing students that they can make a difference and um, their voice matters. It, it, so often, civics and history are conflated um, or siloed, one or the other. They're not uh, treated as complementary. How, how do you think schools should uh, better navigate that dichotomy? Um, just simply giving space to the students to discuss and talk. Um, I've been in DC for four years now, and one of the, my first year here, my students said, I didn't think the principal would listen to what I had to say. Um, adults, we have to be more cognizant of making sure that we listen to our students, because if we don't, someone else will. Um, so just giving them that space and opportunity, allowing them to let their voice be heard, and actually listening to them, and not just giving them space, um, uh, ear service or whatever, but actually letting them have a voice. And, and the mock trials that you um, staged, those were another example of that? Could you tell us yes. about that? Yes. Um, so our students learn about, I direct a law and public policy academy at Dunbar High School. And so we have lawyers um, and law students come to our school on a regular basis and discuss with our students what it's like to be in the courtroom, what it's like to have moot court mock trials. And so they actually go through this and they're really enjoying it because it's hands on. They're able to learn from professionals and then go out into the real world and actually showcase what they've learned. Yeah. Uh, Jessica, you, you did something similar. I know you're no longer in schools, but, but you obviously have a lot of experience and, and can kind of look at it from a bird's eye view. Uh, tell us about the curriculum that you developed. Yeah, so I'll, good morning. Um, so I'll backtrack a little bit and say that I was in the classroom. Um, I taught social studies and civics both in the Bronx and in Chicago. And it was the case of a lot of folks closing the door and doing what work we thought is good work that would be done, but fearing that a school district might not be excited about us talking about political issues of the day, right? Um, and then the school district in Chicago in 2012 launched what they called the Global Citizenship Initiative, which was a pilot to allow, um, to start teaching civics as a course. And um, Illinois was one of 10 states that didn't have a civics requirement. So I signed up to be one of those pilot teachers and within a year I ended up going downtown and working um, with the task of trying to figure out how to build this pilot into a district-wide curriculum um, that could be accessible to teachers. And one of the, the lessons of that work was that we had wonderful curriculum that was out there and wonderful partners, but they weren't all pieced together in a way that made sense for teachers. And I think a lot of us, Shalina and I were talking about that, there's so many wonderful resources and you kind of have to pull them. And we thought for teachers who we were asking to teach a brand new course, we wanted to be able to give them some structure, but then some choice to respond to what their young people were interested in, the histories and issues of relevance in their communities. And so we created a curriculum that looked a little bit more like a Mad Lib than it did like a traditional scripted curriculum, where we said these are the kinds of activities and learning that should happen. These are the big questions we think are important to explore. But, and here are some resources for that, but you have to construct a curriculum that is responsive and relevant to the, the issues in the lives of the young people in front of you. And even in the city of Chicago, it's a giant city. There's a lot of diversity. There are a lot of communities with unique issues and histories. And so we wanted to give some flexibility for teachers to be responsive 
responsive to that and craft curriculum with their students, with their communities. And so the curriculum that we created is called Participate, a civics curriculum for Chicago's youth, with the idea that we wanted it to not just be about federal issues and learning about the federal government, but we wanted to offer young people the opportunity to explore local Chicago history that's really important to them and to understand Chicago's role in the larger state. Um, and it's not a perfect curriculum. We worked with teachers to craft this over time. It's now in a second iteration. And I think we've adopted, or you know, I'm not, no longer in the school district, but the district has adopted really an approach that says that this curriculum is the property of the teachers and students, and so we're going to collectively work to build that curriculum. And I think it's why it's had staying power. It's being used in over 90 of the high schools in the city. I think there's only one or two that haven't yet adopted it, and we've given the choice of schools to use it. Um, but we're really proud of that. And the question that it asks students to interrogate is, you know, what is my power in our democracy? How will I choose to use it? Um, and I think that that's really the focus of, you know, where I, we saw civics education needing to move, which is that young people need to understand what are the, the channels of power, but they also need, and they need to understand their place in it. Um, and they need to practice and build those skills that'll let them do that. You know, demystifying this thing that seems so far away and bringing it home and focusing on the issues that really matter to them. One component that I find really compelling is the reparations curriculum. And yeah. could you tell us more about that and, and how yeah. it to that? So in Chicago, there is um, a very infamous, terrible case of a history of torture by the police department and police commander and some of the people under his um, watch um, over decades where they were torturing black men and, and uh, you know, um, Retreat, how do you say the word, uh, taking false confessions and things and, and locking people up for a long time. Um, and there was a sustained campaign by people in the city over many years to reveal that this was happening and um, to bring justice to the community. And eventually a reparations package was, was um, signed by the city council. And one of the things that the survivors felt was really important was yes, monetary, um, compensation but the, and you know building of a memorial so that the city would never forget that this happened but they said they wanted students to learn about this so it would never happen again and so we worked with survivors we worked with community advocates and we built a career and teachers the teachers union included and we built a curriculum called reparations one which which sought to kind of uncover what was that history? How was that allowed to happen for so long? How were voices ignored that were saying this really terrible thing was happening in this city that we love? And so students explore that history, but then we ask them to think about what would it mean for our communities to thrive today, to have healthy relationships between police and the community? What are all the possible ways we might organize and, and build these relationships? And so young people get to think about different perspectives to that question and then come up with their own ideas about how to heal and move the city forward. Got it. Uh, I want to get back, I want to definitely yeah. expand on the idea of, of, of really ele elevating kids' lived experiences in the curriculum. But before I get to that, um, probably Louise or any of you can answer this. One thing that I hear a lot in, when I interview teachers is just uh, the difficulty of, of adopting a whole additional subject. There's that perception that this is something you tack on, that it's not something that you kind of weave in organically into the other other subjects that teachers are um, uh, teaching students. So Louise, how do you, what do you say when, when you hear that sort of concern? Yeah, so actually that, that did not come up in Massachusetts when we uh, passed legislation. Many other states have done the same. Um, but it is a valid concern, right? If we treat schools as just a, a vessel on which we just impose more and more and more stuff without providing the resources, the training, and the environment to, for support for civics, it's not going to work. So we need to make sure that we allocate the resources and that we um, set up a, a situation so that schools can create civic learning plans. So a, a lot of what I think worked in um, Chicago or in, in Illinois is this idea of a school that is dedicated to the mission 
of generating and graduating citizens or civic participants in our civic life. You do that not only in civics class, right? So you do that throughout. So for example, civic skills, how to write a letter to your congressperson or your city councilor. That is something that you can teach in an English class, right? Uh, how to allocate a budget, something you can teach in a STEM class. Uh, uh, how to uh, be a responsible uh, uh, member of your school community. That is something that you can do throughout the school day and outside of the school day. So those are the kinds of attitudes that we're going to have to adopt um, it, inside uh, school districts and schools uh, to actually make this possible. And then you're also going to have to allocate budget. <laughs> At what age should we yes. start teaching kids these skills? Uh, well, so right now, I think um, most of the civic education is focused at middle school and high school. We need to start earlier. We need to start elementary. We need to be able to weave this throughout um, the entire schooling experience and then continue at the higher ed level, right? This should be thought through. Um, these are, whether you're going to college or not, you're going to be a member of a community and we have to recognize that that's important and that we have to live together and try to find a way to resolve what are now very complicated problems across a lot of differences. Yeah. So back to the sort of uh, cultural relevance of, of civics curriculum. Um, is it different teaching civics to say a predominantly African-American school uh, classroom versus a predominantly white classroom? Um, no, I don't think it is. Um, whatever, when you're teaching, you always have to find the relevancy in what you're teaching to your group of students. So um, what I do may look slightly different in my classroom because of my population, but we're still doing the same thing. Um, we're still having the same results. For example, um, going back to my student voice committees, um, one of the top issues at my school last year also was um, student behavior. We had students from all over the district come to my school um, and there were difficulties because what happened in the community um, bled over into our school community. Mm -hmm. There were issues with that. So one of the suggestions from students was, well, instead of adults always deciding what will happen to us, whether we're going to be suspended or put in detention or whatever, why can't you allow us the opportunity? Sometimes when we speak to our uh, friends, we can understand them better because we're the same age. We understand what they have to go through when they have to walk home every day, um, when they have to stay after school late because of certain situations in the community. All of that plays a role. And so now we have a peer court opportunity for my students. I'm training them so that they can actually see um, how can students, how can my friends repair the harm that they've done to the community. Sending me home is not going to help. What can we do here in the community to assist? Yeah. Um, and so just things like that, I think, are very relevant, giving students advocacy um, skills to do that. But that's not to say that race, ethnicity, uh, gender, religion, uh, socioeconomic class doesn't affect or have influence on what you're teaching or what you're, what you're emphasizing in the classroom, right? right? It does. Yeah, it does. yeah. How does it affect it? Maybe, Jessica, like you, you've done a lot in... Um, developing these sorts of focused curriculum. Well, one thing I do want to say is that I hope we don't um, fall, though, into a thing where we think, well, only black students or students of color should learn about race and racism, right? right? Like, I think yeah. that that sometimes, it's only, you know, we only learn about some issues if it affects you. I think that mm -hmm. as a country, it is baked into our history and it affects how politics work today. And so it is the responsibility of all of us to learn about that. And that means that teachers who teach in predominantly white communities need to get comfortable with how to talk about race with white students. Um, but it also means that if we're dealing with, um, that we need to talk about issues of racism and anti-blackness with Latino students. And we need to talk about issues of immigration with black students. That, and we need to talk about indigenous sovereignty with white kids in Oklahoma. Wherever we are, we need to be always talking about these issues. There's not a, um, you know, that this is this issue right. for this kind of student. Right. So I, I do want to make sure that we, we kind of hold that. And then the other thing I think is that 
um, this is hard, challenging work, right? It's really difficult, and these issues are so close and personal to people's lives and their lived experiences. So educators need support in how to do that, right? We need space to explore. We need policies that are permissive, that allow for teachers to do this kind of work, um, and that welcome them into that in a way that is healthy and supportive of the young people in front of us. And that's really hard. I would not, you know, we spent years, work, we've been working at it for a long time, and I think it's incumbent upon us, though, to not pretend these issues don't exist. Because they do, and if our schools ignore them, and if students walk in the door and are expected to forget everything they faced between when they left the door and getting to school, they, we are selling a false product, and it builds um, disinvestment of young people into what we're teaching because it's not believed that we really see and understand the issues affecting them. Do you want to add something? Um, I want to connect that with something you asked about before. You asked about how to integrate history and civics, and uh, Jessica's talking about um, this uh, tension that we have with current events and how to tell those stories. Um, the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Department of Education just awarded a grant to iCivics and uh, uh, Arizona State University, Harvard, and Tufts. Um, that grant is to develop a roadmap for to do exactly that, to integrate the the gory and the glory of our country in a roadmap for how uh, we should be teaching history and civics for the new demographic in our country, for today's really diverse learners, right? We're, we're, there is a shift in demographic uh, in many, many of the large cities where majority minority. Uh, so those, that question is really urgent. What is iCivic's guidance around um, navigating the political climate currently? Obviously, it's it's especially fraught right now, and teachers are, it's a really fine line between kind of engaging with it too much and, and not engaging with it enough, so. Right, I, I mean, uh, so uh, as Jessica said, it, this is hard, right? So I'm not gonna give you an answer. What uh, educators like about iCivics is that we start with the facts. So if a uh, inquiry, an impeachment inquiry, for example, is happening now, we're gonna teach about it, but we're gonna teach about it from the facts. We're not gonna teach about it about from a polarized state, uh, and we are going to provide educators support uh, and guidance about how to do that. Um, so that is where you start with your students, and then after that, you have to have the skills to be able to have a conversation with your students, which is where uh, a lot of the learning happens um, across differences, right? Many of our classrooms are also polarized, uh, and we have to recognize that uh, all over the country. So we try to do those two things. We start with the facts, we anchor them in how to make that relevant to students, and then we provide support for educators. One, one current event is the teacher strike in Chicago, right, that just um, ended last week, and, and seem, obviously there's been a wave of teacher strikes throughout the country. It's, it's hard to ignore it, and the issues seem a lot more um, sort of uh, profound and, and sort of um, uh, social, social justice minded. How are teachers navigating that in Chicago right now, in their classrooms? Well. Twitter is such an awesome tool because it gives you this lens into what people are thinking about. And a lot of teachers are on Twitter and sharing ideas. And right after the strike, teachers were talking about, how am I going to go in tomorrow and talk about this? Um, how are my five-year-olds that are going back to kindergarten, how are they going to be approached with this? And I think... Um, the discussion in the city was always around like what are the resources necessary for our schools to thrive and what's so interesting about this kind of wave of teacher engagement is that it's not so much about the wages and salaries, although that is a relevant issue, particularly for school support staff who weren't making very much and whose children are in our school communities. but. The, the issues are, what are the things te students need? Social workers, counselors, librarians. These are like kind of it, things we think are essential to schools and yet our schools didn't have. Um, and I think that actually the CEO of the public schools and the union came out after and said this was a hard fight, but we all do want more for our schools and we need a bigger pie to draw from to give the resources. And teachers went into classrooms asking, what do we need to thrive in this school? What are the resources that you need to learn? And asking those kinds of questions to get at this, it, are these polarizing 
politics is not neutral in that sense, right? Like it's, <laughs> to learn politics, you, you're going to end up encountering political views. The question is, can we do it in a way that invites exploration and inquiry? Can we invite students to be the ones that imagine what is possible for them? And I think a lot of the teachers did go back to school and asking those questions. We were fighting for what we thought was best for our schools. What do you think is best for our schools? Uh, and we'll end with a question from the audience. Is there a role for parents in civics in public school? So how can civic or parents really participate in this process? I'll give you a quick answer. They can advocate. <laughs> uh, we need civics in our schools in a very, very uh, different way than it is taught now. It is a direct uh, effect. If parents speak up and say they want it, it will occur. So that's number one. Uh, number two is that they can participate with out-of-school experiences and help support what happens in service uh, to your community outside of schools. Yeah. But actually, yeah. Since you're on the ground and, and probably engaging with parents every day. So ditto basically everything Louise said. Um, just being engaging in the school community, encouraging the students, um, and just um, discussing with the teacher. Connect with the teacher and find out what's going on, um, and involving your students in what's going on in uh, real life. All righty. Well, thank you so much. That was an excellent conversation. Thank you. And now, for a conversation about entertainment, culture, and civic engagement, please welcome CAA Foundation Executive Director Natalie Tran, here with author and journalist Kathleen Koch. Good morning, everyone, and good morning, Natalie. Hello. So your foundation is so cool because what you do is you really harness the, the vast power and reach of the entertainment industry for, uh, for social good. Uh, and I know you cover a lot of different topics, but we're here today to talk about democracy and civic engagement. And so beyond um, the CAA Foundation, you have started both the Civic Culture Coalition and the successful I'm a Voter campaign. So talk to us about those. Where did those come from? Sure. So uh, CAA, as, as an entertainment agency, uh, entertainment and sports agency, is very much in support of our clients and the work that they do. Um, but in 2018, right before the midterms, I think we were all grappling with what role can we play in what is going on in our country right now. Um, and we invited some of the leading nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan civic engagement organizations to CAA just to learn about what they were doing. And we invited um, our peers at other studios and networks, um, management companies, PR companies, and brands just to learn about what was going on in this space. Um, and quickly realized that a lot of them were running their own campaigns and um, they were really trying to break through the pop culture sort of barrier. Um, and fortunately, that's the space that we work Perfect. in. So we, <laughs> we decided, well, what if we actually used our chits? What if we actually used uh, what we know best and actually created an environment to which voting was desired? And that might make it a little bit easier for these nonprofit organizations to work in this space. Um, and if we could connect them and help um, connect them to some of these companies that might be a little bit harder to get into, but it's just one phone call away from us because we work in that industry. Um, so that's how the Civic Culture Coalition came to be. We really wanted to create a safe space for companies who maybe had never said the word vote out loud before or weren't really sure how they could talk about voting to their audiences. And so around a large table, we had some unbelievable individuals representing companies like Urban Outfitters and Paramount and Bad Robot, um, Universal Music Group, coming together to say, okay, we want in, we want to figure this out, but we need a little bit of help, so let's do it together. Um, so that's how the Civic Culture Coalition came to be. We really wanted to be a one-stop shop for companies to come in and learn about how they can engage their audiences. And then what about I Am A Voter? Because those, those we, I think you're wearing the pin, right? Aren't you? Very cool. Your hair's <laughs> covering it, but oh, it's there. <laughs> um, so I Am A Voter is a nonpartisan movement that was started by um, a group of volunteers that really aimed to shift the culture around voting. And um, what we did was we sort of studied the way that we want to talk about voting the way that brands 
talk about their products. We want to be like supreme. We want people to be waiting the night before uh, their polling place to go and vote the next day. Um, and so we, at the end of the day, just really want everyone to say those magic words, I am a voter. And so we just sort of reverse engineered it and created a, a campaign called I am a voter. Um, and it's black and white. It's nonpartisan. We don't talk about issues or candidates. It really is about getting people registered to vote and then um, going going out to vote. What are some of your secrets? Because, uh, and are you really, who are you targeting? Are you targeting the younger demographic, the 18 to 29 year olds, because uh, they vote at what, half the rate of those over 65, right? Exactly, exactly. So we, we exactly right. We're targeting um, young people. We want to target an inclusive audience. Um, and we really wanted to um, also target, of course, the entertainment and sports industries. How do we actually leverage these massive networks to talk about voting? And you do that um, in something that is very simple and clearly stated, and that any company feels safe enough to want to push out on their own social networks. So which is why a lot of our branding and the campaign work is just very simple, because when you tend to add colors in it, unfortunately, it becomes emotional and people will have a different um, idea of maybe what it stands for. But if you just stick to something oh, that's black and white, so that's why it's black and white. You can't really argue what that is. And the reality is also voting. I mean, it, there, it shouldn't be a conversation. It should just be something that you do, like putting on your seatbelt. Right. So I, I saw in an, a recent interview, you said, we need to teach people how to be of service to each other and, and our communities. I mean, did we forget something along the way about civic engagement? I mean, I remember when I was a kid, and we had civics in school and the, the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. We had our service projects and we had civics badges. And, and when I turned 18, you couldn't imagine not voting. I mean, that would have been such an abdication of, of your civic responsibility. Mm -hmm. So are you, are you essentially having to make civic engagement cool again? And, and how hard is that? It's a great question. I think it's, I think it's difficult because I think now you're competing with the 500 other things that's popping up on your phone and what you're seeing in the news and what's going on in the world. It just is a little bit more of a complicated place to be. But our approach with I Am A Voter um, is, is we want to meet people where they're at instead of expecting people to come to us. Um, and that is going to be in, on billboards, in brands, where you shop on, on your phone. Um, we did this massive National Voter Registration Day um, digital takeover on Instagram. Um, and the campaign's only really been around for about 14 months, but we've had 1.6 billion social media impressions. We've gotten about $16 million of donated ad space that I say otherwise would have gone to pizza and laundry detergent and is now instead talking about the importance of voting. Um, but that's and important to you too. I wanted to touch on that as an individual. Um, you are the, da the daughter of, of Vietnamese refugees. So talk to me about why this is so special. Yeah, you. so on a, on a personal note, you know, my, my parents came here when, when the war in Vietnam came and uh, like you mentioned, they were refugees and they came here on a fishing boat and they never got a chance to vote. Um, and so when they came here and they are like such believers of the American dream as, as I am too, um, it was a really important thing that they taught us that this was something that was special and treasured and something that not everyone gets to do. Um, and now I feel even more fortunate that I get to work at a company that is so supportive of this and, uh, and our ability to sort of use our unique position in popular culture to help encourage other people to, to vote. You know, before we go to the audience questions, because they're already starting to come in, um, I, I wanted to ask you, um, what, um, when, what do you think is the greatest success so far that you have had in the, in the I am a voter? I and think what's next? Great question. Um, I think it's, it's talking to brands that have never engaged in this space before or have never pub done something public around civic engagement before. Um, a fun example is Bumble, the, the dating app, which is, um, <laughs> Bumble, the dating app, uh, embedded an I'm a voter badge into their dating profiles. So now when you go online and you create your dating profile, you can say, I'm a coffee lover and I'm a voter. And you can also match with other voters. Um, but how cool. Like, it's all right. about how do you normalize voting? Um, 
And so that, it, that goes back to sort of our approach with IMO Voters is sort of really meeting people where they're at. So whether it's, you know, Urban Outfitters is, um, created this beautiful line of t-shirts last year that said I'm a voter and vote, and they printed the election day reminder on all of their, the receipts for four weeks leading up to election day. So that just makes it a very normal thing. And so we're talking, you know, when we're talking about how we build content and how we're talking about how we approach brands, it's brands that we use every day, but where you might not normally see this work being talked about. But I understand you're forming a new group, the Civic Alliance. Yes. So last year with the Civic Culture Coalition, um, because we are, you know, from the entertainment industry, the majority of the uh, companies we brought together were sports and entertainment. Um, and now we have this really exciting opportunity to actually open up our network even more um, and partner with another coalition that is a little bit more housed in the tech space. So what happens when we bring our worlds together um, and become almost a super coalition and are able to attract even more companies and organizations to this work? Um, because our hope is that, obviously, that this isn't just just a spike that happens once every four years, that this is something that corporate America is constantly engaged in every single year. And then through that, hopefully the trickle down effect is that, you know, normal people like me are voting in their local elections and state elections. This is very cool. So this will go beyond the entertainment industry. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Our hope is to get everyone engaged in this. All right, well, speaking of engaged, a question from the audience. How can an educator like me convince nonprofits to invest in civic engagement? My organization cut our entire civics and social justice curriculum last year. How sad. It's so heartbreaking. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a great question because I think whether you're an educator or anyone, I think we've talked about how civic engagement is is getting cut from a lot of different places. Um, and the Ad Council just put out this uh, incredible report a couple weeks ago that talks about um, uh, the one thing that, uh, that most people sort of identify with voting is the issues that they care about. So I think regardless of whether you're in education or social justice, at the end of the day, like the one thing that can turn all of our activism into real change is if you go out and vote. So being able to tie, you know, you can tie voting into every little thing that there is out there. Um, so that might be a, an approach. Let's see. All right, another question. Um, currently, both parties don't agree we should increase the number of people who vote. What is your group doing to protect and expand voting rights and access? So I'm a voter specifically is very strictly registration and get out the vote. I think there are a lot of incredible organizations that are working in this space, in the voting rights space. So um, you don't lobby in that area? Yeah, we're not in that, we're not in that area. For us, we'll, we'll happily direct people to the experts that are, doing, that are doing that work. Okay, how do we grapple with the value of social media as a means for encouraging students to pursue civics and the danger that social media poses and has posed to crippling democracy? Interesting. I think the reality is for the millennials and generations after that, social media is going to be the main point of contact for them. That's where they're going to find the majority of their information. And it's also going to be where those who are not normally contacted by campaigns are going to be getting their information. So whether or not you like it or not, it, you know, it, it's, it's the new reality it's for us. Stay. And it's here to stay. And I think it's... Um, it's an element that we're all going to have to figure out. How can we use this to actually engage a younger audience? Um, because it's, it's the new norm for them. And a question from Laura. Um, arts and activism have often been connected. Does the idea of selling and marketing civics tie into the combination of creative and civic expression? Um, I'm... I, I, I guess uh, what, what Laura maybe is asking, I mean, it, for instance, with, with what your organization does and the, the Civic um, Culture Coalition, I mean, you're, you're people who are experts in music and graphics and, and arts and, 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 and words to communicate. So, you know, does this make it you better, I guess, maybe, is that what you do? That's yeah, so we're definitely... 
you know, w what we're working on right now is how do we get into writers' rooms? How do we get into the into the rooms where um, mass content is being created for larger audiences? And how do we use that as a tool for us to talk about voting or even just saying words like voter registration and all of that? So how do we use art to inform a lot of what the messaging is? Um, is is definitely important to us and is, is something that we see um, something that we'll, we'll be working on moving forward. And Will asks, should we be concerned about encouraging voting <clears throat> merely because it is cool to do so? Unlike putting on your seatbelt, voting is an exercise of power. <laughs> I knew that was going to come back <laughs> to me. <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're really focused on talking to people who don't normally talk about voting or who may not normally be engaged in this space or who may have family members that vote, but they will definitely be seeing advertisements by, you know, large brands. Um, and, you know, in the communities where maybe civic engagement organizations may not be working. So we're just trying to get people who are so brand new to this space that the only way they might actually pay attention is if it looks something, if it looks like a brand versus a, maybe a more traditional civic engagement approach. So we're just trying to t draw people in. And then once they're in, once they under, even understand what the word vote means and what the power of that, then we can talk to them about, you know, educating them on issues, educating them on candidates, educating them on all the other things that comes with voting. But we're just trying to talk to the folks that aren't normally spoken to right now. Right, where it's not a part of their DNA. Once you draw them in, then maybe they'll take that ball and right, work with exactly. it. Right, exactly. Okay, what can companies do, um, asks Anonymous, to pressure, put pressure on reversing voter suppression efforts and gerrymandering? Mm. It's a tough question. You know, I think, uh, I, I think companies have an, an unbelievable power by encouraging their employees to get active. And I think things like voter suppression and gerrymandering, obviously it's specific to the, to the areas where you're from, um, the employee network is such a powerful network, um, and most companies will have an infrastructure where they can, you know, be dispersing information out to their employees and getting their employees engaged in creating specific um, action steps for their employees to be calling their, you know, individual, you know, their local um, individuals and learning more about what that means and what's going on in their states. So I think um, companies can definitely use their employee base. You know, as we wrap, I, I'd like to ask you a little bit about uh, what happened yesterday. There were elections around the country, and um, it was so fascinating to see turnout shoot up in places like Virginia and Kentucky. And is that perhaps the, the silver lining in the great gray cloud of intense partisanship that we face today that more Americans than ever are maybe finally going to engage? I think it's so exciting. Like, I cannot wait for next year um, because what we're seeing now, I think, will only be a small glimpse of you know, what will happen next year, the craziness of what will happen next year. And I'm so moved by all these young people that are showing up on Fridays for the climate strike and they're spending their Saturdays out marching and they're, you know, I certainly didn't grow up spending my Saturdays marching. Um, and I'm so inspired by them and then they're so plugged in and, you know, because of so social media, they're learning about all these issues that may be affecting a community that is different than theirs and they're getting activated, they're going online, they're plugging in, they're, they're meeting. So I, I think next year is going to be really exciting and I, I can't wait to see what's going to happen. All right. Thank you so much. Natalie yeah. Tran with the CAA Foundation. Thanks. <laughs>to talk about the rule of law and the rules of baseball, please welcome Paul Finkelman, the president of Gratz College. Good morning, it's a delight to be here. Um, I wanna start by saying as a lifelong Brooklyn Dodgers fan, uh, my hat, 
Uh, I don't want you to confuse it with that other team from Boston with a B on it. Uh, I, I uh, want to congratulate the Washington Nationals and Washington Nationals fans. Uh, somebody gave me a substitute hat to wear, uh, but it's so warm in here, I don't think I will. But in any event, I want to tip my hat to the Nationals uh, in winning their first World Series since 1924. Uh, the Dodgers, of course, have not had a losing season for 75 years, uh, and at least in Brooklyn. And... Um, and so uh, what the Nationals' victory shows is that history repeats itself, although sometimes it takes nearly a century to do so. Uh, what I would like to talk about today is the way in which baseball, in a sense, creates a sense of civic education. Uh, so here we have our Nationals team winning and everybody's crowding around them. But the important thing about baseball is that in addition to being a game, baseball is a entirely coherent, self-contained legal system. It is a legal structure. And if you think about it, it is the only sport like this. First of all, it has a highly educated, highly trained, professional set of judges. Unlike, say, that other sport where they throw the holy spheroid on weekends, uh, where everybody points out that the people who are actually arbitrating the game usually don't know what they're doing. Uh, baseball umpires have to go through minor leagues. They have to go through training. They actually have to be promoted to the major leagues. It's a very different system. And nothing in baseball happens without a judge ruling. It's not a strike, it's not a ball, it's not a fair ball or a foul ball until an umpire makes a ruling. If you watch a game, spend one day watching the umpires. It's really fascinating. And, of course, the, because the umpires are there, we have to think about how do umpires think about baseball. Uh, we also learn by watching umpires and players how to follow rules, how to accept the ruling of courts. A batter stands there with a lethal weapon, a heavy wooden stick. He's a big person or she's a big person. They're healthy. They're, they're, they're athletes. Umpire says strike three. What does the batter do? Goes back to the dugout. They may whine. They may complain a little but they go back to the dugout. They don't stand there and argue the call. And why is that? Because as we learned in a league of their own, there's no crying in baseball, right? You struck out, you have been, the judge has ruled on you, you're gone. Um, similarly, what we learn from baseball is that while you may argue with the umpire, and I'm going to talk about that in a second, there are limits to what you can say just as in a courtroom. You can be held in contempt of court for the way you behave to a judge, and of course you can be kicked out of the game. There are certain things you cannot say. You cannot defame the umpire. You cannot say certain words to the umpire. If you don't believe me, watch the movie Bull Durham. Those of you who have seen it know what I'm talking about. So in this highly legalistic game, with this set of judges, and there are four judges in a normal game, seven judges in the World Series, the game often turns on how you read the rules. You'll see in a baseball game a manager storming out of the dugout not to dispute what the umpire saw, but rather to dispute the rule the umpire applied. I've actually watched games where the manager is pointing to the rule book and saying, you don't understand the rule or you've misapplied the rule. You haven't read the rule properly. Um, you don't see this in other sporting events. And of course, the judges themselves, the umpires, are like common law judges. Think of three umpires talking. The first one says... I call them as they are. The second one says, I call them as I see them. And the third one kind of smiles and says, they ain't nothing till I call them. If you understand that, and we all grew up understanding that, then you can understand whether we like the outcome or not, that Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Clarence Thomas can legitimately adjudicate a case before the Supreme Court even though they come to the decision from very different perspectives. 
And this year there was a case which was a nine to one case uh, in which Thomas and Ginsburg agreed. Ginsburg wrote the opinion. I'm, I'm thrilled to say she quoted me in it, so that's why I know about this case. But the point is that we accept the legitimacy of the ruling because we accept the legitimacy that there may be different ways you approach the law just as the umpire says, I call them as I see them, and the other umpire says, I call them as they are. So this is part of what we learn. Similarly, you will see a batter occasionally turn around on a called strike. Batter does this. He's not telling the umpire, you idiot, why don't you get glasses? He's asking a simple question, where was it? Because what the batter wants to know is where is the strike zone today? Now, if you know the rules of baseball, you know that the strike zone is from the armpits to the knees, over the plate. Well, if in major leagues, with 100 mile an hour balls or 90 mile an hour balls, if they called the strike zone that big, we'd have infinite number of 15 inning one run games with tons of people striking out. So in fact, while the rules of baseball have not been formally changed, there is in fact a constitutional jurisprudence in baseball which says nobody calls the strike zone as it's written because if you did it would destroy the game. And just as it's very difficult to amend the Constitution by a formal amendment and so we have the informal amendments at times through judicial interpretation, so in baseball the umpires have amended the Constitution. By the way, there, there's talk about having you know balls and strikes be called by computers. If they did that the game will be destroyed instantly because the computer will call the full strike zone because it will be programmed to do so and that will make the game so weird that nobody will want to watch it. There's also pellet process in baseball. On a check swing, when the batter starts to swing and pulls back, and the umpire calls a ball, the catcher can appeal that call to either the third or the first base. It's an appellate process, and it's a legitimate appellate process because the first or, or, or first base or third base umpire can say, no, he actually swung, it's a strike. And you can argue, as I've said, and people do, every little leaguer is a future lawyer. Every little leaguer is a natural litigator because we all understand that you can argue, but when you lose, when the umpire says, no, I'm not changing my mind, and of course they never do, then you go back to the dugout. You don't got up and scream obscenities at the umpire. You don't say the umpire is illegitimate. You don't say I don't have to follow the rules of the judge because we live in a society run by a constitution and baseball is run by its own constitution, the rule book. And as I said, there are certain things you can't say to an umpire. Furthermore, you can't touch an umpire because if you touch an umpire, you get thrown out. And that leads to the sacrosanct notion that we have in this country that we don't attack the judges. Unlike many countries, there have been very, very few instances where judges have been attacked by angry plaintiffs, angry defendants, angry people in courts because we grow up understanding that the judge, like the umpire, is not somebody you hit with the bat or hit with your fist. Uh, the former Yankees manager, Joe Girardi, who is now going to move to where I live, Philadelphia, to be the Phillies manager, he often comes up to an umpire to argue like this. Sticks his nose right in the umpire's nose, right in his nose, but his hands are, why does he have his hands clasped? Because he doesn't want to get excited and wave his hands, because if he hits that umpire by accident, you're out of here. You're out of the game. So this is all part of the process of understanding baseball. Now, baseball has arcane rules, but the development of the rules reflect the development of law in the United States. Take the infield fly rule. You all understand it, right? Of course not, because it's a really complicated rule. But let me explain. It's really not that difficult. If there are fewer than two outs, and there are runners on first and second, or runners on first, second, and third. And there is a fly ball that is hit that could be caught by an infielder with ordinary effort. 
And by the way, it doesn't have to be in the infield. It only has to be able to be caught by the infielder. So there was a, a game a few years ago where the ball was like five feet behind the infield. It was still called an infield fly rule. What that means is the batter is immediately out. Why is the batter immediately out? Because the assumption is that the infielder can catch this ball with ordinary effort and therefore the infielder is making the out. But why do we have this rule? We have this rule because otherwise the guy could drop the ball. And if there are runners on first and second or runners on first, second, and third, they now have to run because now it's an automatic out. And therefore, the fielder can get a double or triple play. However, if the runners think he's going to drop the ball and they run, then the fielder catches it and he can still double them up or triple them up because they left the base before the ball was caught. So the infield fly rule, now you all understand it, right? Do I need to do it again? Uh, now you all understand it. The infield fly rule is essentially an anti-fraud law. Because what it is doing, and this is very important, what it is doing it is it is preventing the fielder from committing fraud by doing something for which the runner has absolutely no defense. Because remember, if he drops the ball, the runner's going to be thrown out. But if he catches the ball and the runner ran, he's still going to get thrown out. So the infield fly rule essentially is an anti-fraud law. The infield fly rule reflects the notion in American law developed and articulated by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes that law is the result of experience. So that early in baseball there was no infield fly rule. And then in a game where an infielder dropped a fly ball, not on purpose, by the way, it wasn't a fraudulent act, just bad play. The newspapers the next day said, wow, what if he did it intentionally? He could start doubling people up. And so immediately, the experience of baseball leads to a new rule. This is how our legal structure works. The other piece of baseball is that baseball is a team sport. Baseball teaches you to be a team player and even to make sacrifices as a team player. The sacrifice blunt, the sacrifice fly. This all illustrates the way baseball works. I want to give you an example of the counter example. That famous sport where everybody obeys the rules and everybody follows the rules, the sport of golf. Because of course, golf is the ultimate self-dealing game. Right? Golf players write down their own score. <coughs> if the ball can't be played properly, they drop it over their shoulder, but a little push it can go a lot farther, right? Golfers have do-overs, right? Oh, well, I swung and I missed. I get to do it again. Uh, they call it a mulligan. There are no mulligans in baseball except the guy's last name sometimes is mulligan. You can't self-deal in baseball because unlike golf, except at the very professional level, there are referees and judges in baseball. There are not. And so what we learn from baseball is that we live in a rule-bound society. We live in a society where law matters. During the American Revolution, this guy, Thomas Paine, he did not play baseball, as far as I know. Thomas Paine wrote one of the most important books in American history, Common Sense. It is the book that helped galvanize the American Revolution. Thomas Paine is arguing against the monarchy, and what does he say in Common Sense? He says that when the revolution is over and the Americans have written their constitution, he hoped that one day in the future, a day would be set aside solemnly for proclaiming the charter, that is the Constitution, by which the world may know that so far as we approve of monarchy, that in America the law is king. For as in an absolute government the king is law, so in the free countries the law ought to be the king and there ought to be no other. That, in any event, is the theory of the American Constitution, and it's also the theory of our national sport, baseball. Thank you very much.
As The Daily Show's youngest correspondent, Executive Director of Columbia University Center for Educational Equity, Michael Rebell, and recent Rhode Island High School graduate, Ahmed Sase. Joining them back on stage is the Atlantic's Aliyah Wong. Hello again, long time no see. I, I'm upset they cut out of the clip um, the moment when the reporter, or there are several moments when he called you the oldest man he knows, right, Michael? <laughs> well, maybe the wisest too, right? Right, okay. <laughs> well, um, since you're the oldest one on, uh, up here on the stage, I'll start with you. It, first, can you familiarize us with the, the suit that you uh, spearheaded and have uh, filed and really sort of what the takeaways are and how you um, kind of combine two seemingly distinct issues of civics education and um, a right to education. Okay, well, last year uh, we did file a federal lawsuit in the U.S. District Court in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, claiming that students uh, in Rhode Island and throughout the United States have a right under the U.S. Constitution to an education that's adequate to prepare them to be capable citizens. And the reason this is important is that back in 1973, 46 years ago, the U.S. Supreme Court issued what was at the time a surprising ruling that said there is no right to education under the U.S. Constitution. Uh, following that, there have been a lot of litigations in 47 out of the 50 states in the state courts and there have been mixed results. I'm from New York, we won our case in New York and Rhode Island and, and about 40% of the states, they lost their case. So there's no uniformity about this and specifically when it comes to civics, uh, as Luis Dubé from iCivics mentioned in the, in the prior panel, uh, it's a very low priority and it has been for the last 40 or 50 years. Now the reason we brought this lawsuit at this time is even though the majority of the court held that education is not a right under the U.S. Constitution, that case had to do with the financing of education, they did leave one opening. It was a close 5-4 decision. Uh, the dissenter said, okay, there's not a word about education in the federal constitution, but there is a 15th Amendment that says all citizens have a right to vote. There is a First Amendment that said all people have a right to petition the government to freely express themselves. And you cannot exercise those important constitutional rights without uh, some basic level of education. The court left that question open because the plaintiffs at the time hadn't presented evidence to it. And for a variety of reasons, we decided the time has come to test that opening. So that's why we've brought this case. Uh, we brought it in Rhode Island for a bunch of reasons, but I think it has national significance uh, if we can climb the ladder and get the, the Supreme Court to take the case. Yeah, and I, I want to get back to that legal, legal strategy later because it's fascinating. It's, it's really unprecedented and, and really creative. But first, let's have you, Ahmed, um, tell us about your experience in school. I know you're now, uh, you've graduated. Congratulations, that was last year, right? Thank you, yeah. Yeah, um, or this sure. year, but we spoke last year. Yeah, yeah. You were a senior then. So tell them what your experience in school was like. Sure. So from a very young age, I first started in public school. Um, and I very soon realized, like, by second grade that public school wasn't right for me. The class sizes were far too large, teacher attention was far too low, and my parents were told by a doctor, you know, that I had ADHD and I couldn't focus in um, class and things like that, so I went to a private school. And in my private school, there was two teachers per classroom. There were a lot less students in the classes. There were more breaks, more free time, one-on-one -on -one attention. I could come to school on the weekend if I needed to learn something that I was falling behind on. So I went to private school from third grade up until high school. 
And then I went to the best high school in my state. Um, it, the ranking sometimes changes, but <laughs> classical high school, um, the best high school in Providence, Rhode Island, at least I can say that for a fact. But even the best high school in my state still had a lot of glaring disparities. First of all, the building was horrendous. They would always have buckets collecting like drainage from the ceilings, falling ceiling tiles, brown water in the bubblers, but that's not even anything to do with the quality of the education I was learning. I, I will remember before graduating, a couple weeks before I was handing in some late work because my attendance senior year, you know, senioritis happens. <laughs> Um, and one of my teachers was like, my math teacher, I hope she's watching this, she was like, you should be in jail with your attendance. And you look at me, I don't know why like a white woman would like think that that's her place to be like, oh, you should be in jail. But then she followed, she was like, actually, you're not 18 yet, your parents should be in jail. And I was like, with, with your level of education, with your level of a lens on how to teach people and how to be a compassionate person, you should know that your job is to empower me and not to, you know, kind of question, or not to kind of make me seem like I'm a bad person because of things in my life that I can't control, like a job, like trying to complete all these classes and trying to get all this work done. Um, so that experience a couple weeks before I graduated was really what, cemented the need for this work. I've always been very inclined to speak for issues and to talk about things that affect me in my life. But I think that one thing that people need to realize is that stories are very important. You guys are all in this room because you realize that stories are important and you're listening to people's stories. But the dialogue is the first part. The direct action is the thing that's really gonna change it. That's why I think this case is really important because it's kind of a no-brainer. Everyone who is in this country came here for a better life, for a better experience. I know that firsthand because my parents were fleeing a Liberian civil war. Um, from the beginning of colonialism, discovery doctrine, all that stuff, civics has been necessary. We want people to live together and we want people to be happy and we want a country that is productive, the richest, best country in the world. But we need to address the fact that the country was built on a system that was built by people who had other people doing the work of building the country for them. And they had time to write these rules and codify these things. So how do we change that? And I think civics is very important because civics affects every single facet of life. Po uh, not just politics, education, uh, real estate, finance, healthcare, all these things are affected by civics and politics and laws. And people often think politics, people often think politics are don't ask, don't tell. In elementary school, when I asked my teachers about voting, they were like, yeah, we can't really talk about that. I can't tell you who I voted for. But this stuff affects people's lives. And you guys know that firsthand, because we're in the capital. <laughs> I, I imagine you didn't get any civics education in school, that you got it elsewhere. You had to. I got civics it. education in my middle school, which was community, prepar community preparatory school um, in the south side of Providence. It was very intentional in making sure that uh, historically underserved students got a leg up. So that's how I got into classical, really, because at community prep, I was really challenged and it was rigorous and I really did get a leg up there. They had me do a history project that was like a magazine, as if I had went back in time and talking about like the laws of the time. And I think the era that I chose was like Jim Crow era. So like all these things are things that need to be talked about, but they're really hard discussions to just start up, start out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so Michael, I've described your suit as a bank shot argument. I know we had some disagreement about that that description, but blame it on my editor. Um, what? How, how did you piece the the lawsuit together? How did you really um, decide that you're going to take civics education and use it as a means of really advancing your sort of longer campaign for for um, institutionalizing a, a a rights education in this country? Well, I actually got interested in the issue of civic education or the lack thereof uh, from um, a lawsuit I brought in New York State. We won a big victory that said, 
kids in New York State have a right under the state constitution uh, to a sound basic education. And the court defines sound basic education as the skills kids need to function productively as civic participants. And that really startled me. I said, wow, the court is saying that the most important thing in education is preparing kids for citizenship. And then uh, as we got a lot more money for, uh, for schooling in New York State as a result of this case, but when I looked at what was happening years after we had won, nothing had changed in civics. When there were cutbacks in funding, the first thing to go uh, were all the extracurricular activities, experiential activities of visiting um, uh, city councils, legislators, um, the kinds of debating and uh, mock trials that were talked about. All that is the first to go. It's the lowest priority. But our state court said it should be the highest priority. And I went and researched this. There are 32 highest state courts that have said the most important or one of the most important purposes of education is preparing kids for good citizenship. You go back historically, that's what John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and all our founders said. So there's a link to history and what people who think about this hard, which is what judges do, say in the 21st century. But you look at our schools and it's the lowest priority. So that's when I decided we've got to do something about it. And I started thinking about what to do about it. I was aware of this opening the court left, that they hadn't faced this issue 46 years ago, and the time seemed right. God knows we need more civic education for our kids today. We need it for the adults, but you've got to work with the, um, the coming generation. Uh, so that's why we decided this is the time that's right to bring the suit. People ask me, um, you know, what is the composition of the Supreme Court? Are they going to be open to this? This is not a partisan issue. Whether you're conservative, liberal, I think you have uh, a reason to want our kids to know about the rule of law, to know about the separation of powers, to know how the Constitution works. So that's what this is about. And um, Rhode Island, uh, unfortunately, has one of the worst uh, education system, certainly when it comes to civics. Uh, they don't require any course in civics. They have minimal requirements in history. Um, so that's why we decided to bring the case in Rhode Island. Uh, but we really see it as a test case. And um, if we prevail on this, the ruling will affect all kids in the United States uh, because it's a federal case. Just a reminder to submit your questions if you have them, and we can get to them at the end of this conversation. But just to follow up on the, the focus on Rhode Island, you know, it's, it's not a state that I think, um, at least for me, I'm an education reporter, it's not, it wasn't admittedly on my radar. Um, and and I, I guess the, the issues, once I really read up on the state, they're <coughs> egregious. It, could you, uh, there was a recent report out, right? And, and so you gave us a pretty vivid uh, image mm. of, of what your school is like. Wh sure. Yeah, what, what are Rhode Island schools like? What is the education system like? Well, thanks John Hopkins. They recently did a really <laughs> extensive report on the state of Rhode Island schools and they said they were worse than New York, worse than the worst districts. And it's wild because I graduated from there. They, I was pushed through there. Um, you went to the best school. And I went to the, yeah, the, <laughs> the seemingly best school in the state. Um, I think one thing that always gets people when they think about the state of current education is that they say there's a lack of teachers and there's a lack of you know support for teachers. But I think that school needs to prepare more students to want to be teachers. Uh, there's so many, so many ways that uh, students just don't feel accepted at their schools or they don't feel really valued, they don't feel heard, and they're the people who have to be at school for like eight hours every single day for most of, their, most of their year. I don't really think there's a scarcity of people that want to do this work to teach people about, or to teach the youth about how to change the world that they're growing into. I just think that we need to support it more. I think that the dialogue is helpful, but it's just a start, and more institutions need to start thinking about how to facilitate growth for teaching professionals, because education is like the, the, the way you see your lens through life. And I grew up not really questioning systemic oppression or not really questioning why corporations are so like laxly uh, regulated. And these are things that are like pivotal to America and these are things that we 
I, I personally don't think are sustainable. I don't know if you all think these things are sustainable, but the systems and the way that things are set up currently need to be changed by the people who actually live in them and not just the people who have the power to control them. And I think that's what civics at its core, for me as a person of color, for me as somebody who has dealt with poverty, for me as somebody who has dealt with a, uh, an education system, a healthcare system, legal system, all these things that are rigged against people just because of some arbitrary rules that were made up by somebody, I think that civics is the way that you start to get students to think critically about certain things, think critically about how certain institutions keep certain people out, and then we can start to change them when students actually understand how they work. Uh, so the first question from the audience, it's actually a good segue from that. How does promoting school integration tie into civics education in K-12, particularly since schools are um, most segregated and minority kids are over-policed? Well, um, what I think I can say in response to that we define civic education very broadly in this case. It's not just having a class in the 12th grade or the 8th grade. It means uh, uh, providing kids a deep knowledge of history, of how the government works. It means uh, analytic skills, critical analytical skills. It means learning democratic values. It means experiential opportunities. And it means living in a civic society, which means a diverse society. So one aspect of our suit is we are promoting diversity in schools, and we think that's an obligation of Rhode Island and all states. It's a different way. We're not asking the court to overrule a lot of their uh, uh, precedents, uh, directly talking about uh, racial integration. But indirectly, if you take civics seriously, you've got to take a whole new approach uh, to integrating people of all backgrounds. And whether we're talking about race, religion, economic status, uh, that is important. Uh, how can civics education not be a partisan issue when one political party thrives on misinformation and disenfranchising voters who don't fit into their demographic? Easy question. <laughs> uh, not an easy question, but I'll tell you, one of the other things we push for, and again, it's a central aspect of the suit, is what's called media literacy. Mm -hmm. And I submit this is not a partisan issue. Kids in the 21st century, need to know how to use social media and the internet in a responsible, educated way. They do have to know uh, how to separate accurate from inaccurate information. They do have to probe beyond a website and understand who put up the website, where they're coming from, uh, what their agenda might be. And in the long run, that is going to serve all of us, Republican, Democratic. Uh, so we're, we're not looking at today's headlines. We're looking for the future. We're looking for the next generation uh, to be well-educated um, throughout the 21st century. Perfect. Well, we're all done, but there was one question. It wasn't really a question for you. It was telling, asking you if you can be a teacher. So can you? I, maybe. We'll cool. see. We'll see right <laughs> Hope to see you in classrooms. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. For a discussion on the role of higher education, please welcome Ron Daniels, the president of Johns Hopkins University, Wayne Frederick, the president of Howard University, and Carol Quillen, the president of Davidson College. Back to lead the conversation is John Donvan. Thank you. Nice to be back before you again. Um, before we start, I, I'm just curious, did any of the previous panels discuss the root meaning of the word civics? Did that come up? No? All right. So forgive me. This is me at my most pedantic, but I was, f I was forced to take Latin in high school for four years, and it was so successful, I continued doing it in college. And it turned out to be one of the great gifts of my life. But all day long, you know how we all hear a, a musical band in our head all the time? I also hear some, I hear the, the Latin roots of words popping up and they add a dimension of meaning for me and that happened with civics, which I happen to know comes from the uh, Latin word for citizen. And that's essentially what we're talking about when we're talking about civics, I think, which is the, 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 the actual recognition that citizens have not only rights but also responsibilities and a responsibility to participate. In, in public life, in the public square, the agora from a Greek root. 
Um, and so I wanted to talk with these three university presidents, although Davidson proudly at college, right. and two great universities as well, about this point in an individual's life when he or she is a student. That's the point where adulthood is creeping in and also the right to vote is kicking in. What's happening within the, the world of the campus in terms of the awareness, the education, the set of responsibilities, the conversation around this citizenship responsibility? Is it something that universities are dealing with? Do they need to deal with it? What are they doing about it? And so I'll start, I'll start with you, uh, Ron, at Hopkins. And, and, and my concern about asking this question is that it's a great big, huge softball. And it's very easy to give a rote answer saying, yes, of course, we've, we're, we're building future leaders. And if, you know, the, so if we can go beyond that to, to something a little bit more gritty about where each of your schools is, is looking at and taking the issue of this sense of your students ultimately having a role in the world, is that your business? Do you have anything to do with that? Do you think about that? So uh, it is a softball, and the answer is, of course, a vigorous yes, yes yeah. <laughs> uh, that we are uh, deeply committed to this idea. And again, I think it's uh, if your question is going beyond uh, the abstract claim to credibility in this area, what are we actually doing? I think there's a few different ways in which we're uh, grappling with this issue. You know, one is, and it's just in, follows from what you said a few moments ago, voter registration. And I know when you're going to talk about this as as, uh, as, as well uh, at Howard, but uh, making it very clear from the moment that the students get to the campus that one of the responsibilities we see as they enter adulthood is engagement within political institutions, and the most direct and powerful way they do that is with voter registration and, and voting, actual voting, and have been driving that uh, very hard uh, for the last several years at Hopkins. Uh, that's one thing. Second, it's really reflected in what we're doing with the Agora Institute. This uh, initiative, which is designed to foster an understanding of commitment to liberal democracy, to understand its challenges, to understand contemporary problems around polarization and so forth, at one sense dictates a very ambitious research agenda, which we're developing. But another level, we clearly see there's an educative responsibility that accompanies what we're doing with Agora. And so that coupled with, again, we're in the site of um, a building that soon will be a platform for a lot of our Washington-based activities. We're seeing that in conjunction, Agora with uh, this building as being a place in which we can um, uh, more directly get students into Washington, exposure to national uh, institutions, internships, uh, exposure to applied policy problems and so forth, so that we can take some of the more abstract ideas of uh, the challenges that are confronting liberal democracy and give them tools, experiences, knowledge in grappling with them. So I think those are some of the ways in which we're chipping away at this. Wayne? Yeah, and I, I do agree. I mean, I think in terms of that abstract claim, uh, we all certainly have that same mission, but we all obviously have uh, unique populations. And at Howard, you have a unique African-American population who uh, over time has uh, felt disenfranchised and you have a younger population in particular if you look at uh, the past five to ten years who have seen things and are coming to the university recognizing that African Americans in this country have been subject to police brutality and subject to a wide variety of issues. At the same time you have the complexity of them having seen the first black president. And so you have a generation of uh, kids, I have a 15-year-old and 13-year-old, who are growing up in, a, in an America where the first president they knew was a black president. And at the same time, the juxtaposition of that is seeing images on TV of uh, black citizens not necessarily gaining the same things, and also living in a society where they have that uh, complex and confusing sometimes experiences. So with that in mind, what we do at Howard, um, I, I think, is a, a little bit unique because it's fashioned around that African diaspora um, experience. And so the first thing is that uh, when students come to Howard, we tell students that they're not there to come and get a degree. They're there to come and get an education. Mm -hmm. That education comes alive when they go out and change the world. And so the first principle that we try to really embed in the students is that this is not about you, but it's about the larger construct in the world that you're going to live in. And so if you look at, the, at our outcomes 
um, on that, our medical students are more likely to become physicians in underrepresented neighborhoods. Um, our application for medical school has a supplemental application that's focused on whether or not you have an interest in serving in an underrepresented um, neighborhood. Again, stressing that our motto is truth and service. Um, on the very <clears throat> for the day before classes start, um, we have a day of service for our freshmen to participate in. And uh, I would say about 90 to 95 percent of our freshmen participate all voluntary but again coming into the institution that's what they're thinking of we do have voter registration as well that on, the on the first day you have on the very first day of moving um, which is again you know weeks before classes start um, part of what the students do is have voter registration as the students are are you allowed and to offloading. are you allowed to start school if you have not registered to vote you 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 you, you probably are allowed to but it could probably be a little more rough if you are did but uh, I'll leave that alone and then the other thing that we do is um, programming as well in terms of uh, educational programming mm -hmm. so we have a Ron Walters Center um, that's focused on uh, politics. Uh, Ron Walters was a uh, really focused on black politics, really started a, a, a huge body of knowledge around that issue, was a political science professor at Howard, and so their, their programming um, looks at that. And then Gwen and Colbert King, um, Colbert King, uh, most of you would know as an uh, editor in the Washington Post, he and his wife uh, gave a, a, to Howard alum, gave a very generous gift to Howard to start uh, an, an endowed chair professorship in uh, the area of public policy and leadership and so our programming around that also has been really focused on this issue of public policy leadership how you get involved Donna Brazil is holding it now um, Congressman Cummings did it for for two years and so those types of people and the types of things they bring and so I'll end with saying for me one of the most encouraging things I've had in one of those sessions is sitting in a room with students um, primarily freshmen and listening to Elaine King have a speaker talk about what it was like to register to vote as a black person, having somebody walk up to a counter with beans in it and having to guess the number of it. But having that vivid description and seeing students look with that shocked look that the this, this system that they now live in has really come a long way, but so still has a long way. You, do, do, you, do you encounter skepticism on the part of the students that the system is worth participating in? Yeah, there's always going to be skepticism, but the point that we make is that the best, the best way to deal with that skepticism is to change it. Mm -hmm. And so you get the technical knowledge at Howard um, to change it, but then your responsibility is to go out and see what's broken about it and fix it and be the next Congressman Cummings or be the next you know, Donna Brazil and participate in yeah. some way to make it better. Carol. Yes, I, um, just to add to what my colleagues have said, um, I think we have three kind of main obligations with respect to our students. The first is facilitating direct participation. So voter registration, ensuring same, that- Same thing that's organized on campus? Yeah, yeah. organized voter registration. Mm -hmm. In North Carolina, there's increasing um, hurdles to voting um, that have to do with kind of ID you have to provide. So making sure that our identification card will work for students who wish to vote and then facilitating absentee ballots, as well as connecting students with opportunities to work in campaigns or in the offices of local political elected officials. So, so I would say, you know, facilitating participation, enabling conversation on campus is the second thing. We are a microcosm of a pluralistic democratic community on our campus, and to the extent that we can create context where students can learn how to adjudicate their own differences about their own collective lives, that helps them prepare for citizenship in the broader community. And then the third thing is uh, um, helping our students grasp a particular notion of citizenship. You know, like what does it mean to be a citizen in a community, in any kind of pluralistic community where people bring different assumptions and different experiences and different ideas to the conversation? How do you turn that conversation into something beyond a debate? So we have a notion of citizenship as collaborative inquiry where we all come to the table and through our conversation with one another, we actually identify paths forward that were not visible before. So it isn't deciding which of us is correct, but rather figuring out how, given our differences, given our differences, how we move forward to accomplish our shared purpose. And colleges are a really good environment in which to do that because there's enough commonality among the students so that they, do, they can identify a shared purpose.
So, so in a sense, the campus is a laboratory already for yes. for, for later on. And you, you, a lot of things you said are, are t touch on topics I'd like to try to get into. But one of them, very specifically, was you mentioning that the the college is working with students to make sure their ID cards yes. will let them register to vote. And I bring that up because there's a New York Times piece uh, just last month that said that um, one of the parties in some of the states is working to is is implementing requirements and policies that are making it more difficult for students to vote for yes. on campus. And one of them actually specifically goes to how do they prove yes. who they are. Can you just take a minute more on what that challenge is and what your solution is, how you became aware of it? So, so there's a new um, voter ID law in North Carolina. Um, it, uh, right now, you don't have to show photo ID to vote in North Carolina, um, but you will have to do that. And so our goal was to... Um, see if we could create an ID card that complied with the law so that students didn't have to get multiple IDs in order to vote. And um, it, the State Board of Elections has worked with us and, and, and our, you, they've made it possible for us to make a voter compliant ID is mm -hmm. what I would say. So, mm -hmm. so the goal is college ID is compliant, with, it, you know, complies with state law. How do, but how, I'm, I'm just interested in the process. How did you like realize that's an issue, that's a problem, and Students. that's our responsibility? They came to you. Yes, well, I mean, I think we, thought, we saw this and thought, oh, it's gonna be an issue, the state created a process for colleges and universities to apply. Mm -hmm. um, and our students, we have two students, one is conservative, one is uh, leans, le leans left, and they came to us together. They had called the State Board of Election, they called the Federal Bureau of Election, they called in a uh, attorney, and they, they themselves had figured out what the ID, what the criteria were. Mm -hmm. So our students were very eager to make, independent of their own political ideas mm -hmm. were very uh, interested in making sure that students at Davidson could vote. Mm -hmm. um, so so I, I think there's a shared sense that that's, an, uh, that that's important yeah. Yeah. and these students want their voices heard. I, I, will, I will also say that there's increasing skepticism um, among young people that the system does work. I mean, I, I think we, we see this all the time, you know, and and, it, and they have to believe, our, young, our children have to believe that they can change the system or they will opt out and, and, and not participate or, or create alternative systems of adjudication. What, about, what do you do with the fact that sometimes the system does not work? Well, I think you, it doesn't. I mean, it clearly, yeah. do, I mean, the system doesn't work. And, and, there, and there are many dramatic instances uh, wh where that's the case. And, and so... I, I think f for us, the, sometimes students will, uh, you know, want to create an alternative to yeah. explore a different structure. Sometimes they believe that they ha they can find a way to change the system mm -hmm. so that it does work for everybody. Sometimes simply doing the intellectual work of explaining to people why it doesn't work yeah. or what's wrong with it or um, how for example, how, uh, say, structural racism is operating in ways that are perhaps not as visible to everyone and making that clear. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, that just on this subject, you know, one of the things that I worry a lot about is that for a lot of our institutions, um, over the last several decades, we have seen the way in which we discharge our responsibility in the civics domain as about creating opportunities for service learning. And so we're uh, pushing our students out with encouragement into various local community organizations where they're having an opportunity to have direct contact with, um, with communities they may not otherwise come into contact with and with problems, whether it's homelessness or um, problems in education, one can just multiply the examples, drug addiction and so forth, and the kids are getting exposure to those issues. And that's good, I think, in terms of increasing their sensitivity to these issues and the problems of uh, inequality and so forth in our country. But for me, the thing that I struggle with is, um, is that bringing them into direct contact with our formal political institutions? Mm -hmm. And is that equipping them to fulfill the ideal of the democratic citizen, where it's not just that you have sensitivity, that you don't just have um, an appreciation of problems of inequality and so forth, but you actually are willing to engage formal political institutions. And I would say that's something that we're struggling with. And, um, and again, to the extent that the last session points out uh, deficiencies in terms of what our students are receiving in high school before they come to us, 
I worry, particularly in the domain of knowledge around core democratic institutions, I'm worried that we're still not fully scratching that itch yeah. in terms of what we need to do on engagement with the formal mechanisms of government. Well, Wayne, in, in terms of, of any of this being teachable, yeah, you, you, you're a triple Howard graduate, am I right? So, yeah. and, and you're a physician. So you did science. You did STEM stuff. At least you did that. I don't know what else you did. But my question <laughs> goes to that. To, to, the, to that question of whether, you know, do, should there be a, a sort of lean more towards the liberal arts, the things that talk about citizenship and history and philosophy, um, and, and, and do the engineering students need to be made to check in with that stuff? Or do the liberal arts people need to know that data matters and how you interpret data matters and you need to do, be able to do some hard mathematical analysis? to sure. and so. You know, I know that's a little bit of yeah, an old, pretty loaded question, but I'll yeah. I'll, I'll take that. Um, and, and I do have strong opinions about this. The reason I became a physician is because I have sickle cell, and one of the things that that has taught me, being hospitalized as a patient, and now I still practice as as a university president. I still practice. I'm a um, surgical oncologist. I take care of patients with GI cancers, and one of the things that I've observed is that regardless of what we try to do in the classroom. The, the human interaction ultimately is the, the, probably the most important um, opportunity to learn about that, uh, the human condition and about how the human condition works and doesn't work. So for instance, uh, as a university president and as a cancer surgeon, I have students come to the operating room with me, freshmen who are interested in medicine to observe um, cases. What that does is it, a, a few things. It gets me to talk to them in a different environment. It gets them to see a patient um, from the time the patient is getting ready to go in the operating room, the anxiety of it, seeing the patient afterwards. And all of that, I think, is a different experience. Not every one of them is going to become a physician, but that human contact, I think, has to be looked at slightly differently. So I have an undergrad degree in zoology. I did intro to ethics. I did a, a, you know, philosophy courses. I did all of those things all of which I, I still encourage. I think it's, it's important to do that. But I still think that the best experiences our students have that instruct them about those things are the service types of things that they do. So Howard has an alternative spring break mm -hmm. experience where our students go to different parts of the world and they, they lay on church floors and they help people build you know, um, gardens and uh, bring irrigation systems mm -hmm. to... Uh, some of the circumstances and really see the complexity of that circumstance. So I think that that's part of it. The second thing is I think when we look at our general education curriculum, I think we have some very hard and fast rules that we have to start breaking down those walls because I'm more apt to give a student three hours of credit towards graduation for going to um, it's a place like uh, one of the hurricane hit areas recently like Bahamas and spend a week um, really seeing how you put those things back together, what right. the real problems are, and you can, as opposed you can, to you can taking do that a course whether you spend a, a student who spends 90% of his time thinking about algorithms can still go do that. It, it can, can still go do that, and, and, and I think that that's right. But, but the, the, the other thing that I think is important, and I think both of my colleagues have kind of brought this issue, we also have to leave space for the fact that the system does not work for everyone, and, and that sometimes is the elephant in the room. So while we're trying to figure out a way to teach people about this structured system that we sometimes are enamored by and that we are proud about, the reality is that part of actually what is a reality of the system is that it does not work for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not sure that we're always as open about teaching that. Uh, obviously at Howard, that's not a problem. But some of that teaching about that comes out in an organic fashion. Mm -hmm. And it comes out in activism. It comes out in how you approach activism on campus. And while you do want people to engage in dialogue, et cetera, some of it sometimes is messy and yeah. disruptive. Well, let me, we actually have a question from uh, someone in the audience, uh, which is right on this point. College civic ed can feel like, yes, go be politically active, except not at us. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever wrote that question, perfectly composed. Um, and the second part of it, how can college administrations respond to captive activism, activism without discouraging civic engagement? And Ron, you and I were talking, you had an incident last year, you had a sit-in at an administration building, it went on for four weeks. Ultimately, you had to call in the police and shut it down. I'm guessing that was not a very comfortable choice for you or anybody involved, but take on 
that question of, there, there they were doing this thing we're all talking about, fighting for change. In that case, I think the students were opposing um, the university's re relationship, some uh, educational creation. contracts with uh, ICE or something. Uh, it was about the creation of a sworn police force on uh, okay. Hopkins campus. Please. So, okay. yeah. so I, I actually, I think it just take a minute because I think the context really matters here in terms of detailing both uh, the achievements and some of the frustrations of the uh, of of the activism we had last year. But we we um, decided for good reason that we need to have a sworn police force at Johns Hopkins. Just uh, again, Baltimore sadly has some very serious problems with violent crime and lots of problems with the Baltimore City can, Police can, Force. Can so I just interrupt to ask you to take a look at the clock to see where we are in terms yeah. of time left? Thank you. I'll move quickly. I don't mean to be rude, but I just wanted so, to So, But enough to your... just say that, what, that once we decided to adopt a, a sworn police force, what was important is that we need to get legislative sanction for that. And that, that essentially engaged us in a year and a half process with very significant discussion on and off campus, multiple meetings, experts being brought in and so forth. And here what's really instructive is that the stu there was a group of students who were very concerned about the adoption of a sworn force, what it would mean in terms of the uh, ability to have unbiased policing threats that, it would, that the force itself would create in campus. But what they did is that they organized and um, were very effective in the legislature. And what was a one-page piece of legislation that undergirded the statutory framework for all of the other universities in Baltimore, public universities, by the time we were finished, we're the first sort of post-Black Lives Matter uh, request for creating a sworn force, ended up being 27 pages of legislation. That was an unalloyed triumph for the students who had uh, concerns and the community members who had concerns about that. You congratulate that. I do. And, there, and, it was, and it was a direct engagement with uh, existing institutions. It was engagement with us. Ultimately, uh, the uh, protest, which was at, at first, was um, reflected the students' disappointment that the legislation went through at all. And I kept saying, you didn't lose. This was a compromise, but it was a very significant set of wins on your part to go from one page to 27 pages of legislation with a whole series of prescriptions around how we exercise that, uh, that power uh, to create a sworn force. So that um, when they ultimately decided to uh, have a protest that uh, occupied our ground floor for about a month, that was okay, and we, we supported it. We thought it was their legitimate exercise uh, to free expression. Where it got hairy was when they took over a building, and that's where, you know, to my mind, when they moved from a ground floor to taking over a whole building to uh, basically covering up windows and not allowing the administration in, that's when I think you also, it becomes a lesson in democracy. There's guardrails. There's places that you can have protests, you can have, you can have resistance, resistance and free expression, but ultimately there are some lines that can't be crossed if we're going to have an orderly democracy. Thank you, and thank you for taking the time to explain that context. It was very useful. <laughs> Carol. You know, I, I think it is important to, to, to um, engage with students who are trying to make change on our campuses, right? So, and our students are really effective at it. And one of the things they learned, as Ron was saying, is that uh, Democratic processes often result in compromise, right? Part of what you're doing is you're building a coalition to accomplish what you want to accomplish, where the people in the coalition share one thing. They disagree on a lot of stuff, but they all have one goal that they share in common. You build the coalition, you work, and you try to accomplish what you can accomplish, and that that involves some compromise. Our students, in my experience, our students learn how to do that by doing it on campus. So they demand new programs. They demand changes in... Um, you know, our relationship with the community. They want to protest, our students organize a protest around um, uh, police uh, issues in Charlotte and went to the Davidson Town Police, not our police, the Davidson Town Police, and got the permit expedited so that they could have the protests that they want to have with, with police uh, involvement. Like they followed the rules, did the protest against the police who had given them the permit. So I, so I, do you know what I mean? So I, I feel like, and they, they did that because they explained what they were trying to do. Yeah. So, so it's really interesting. If we go back 10 years, the big complaint about college students is they were apathetic. Nobody's talking about that now. Do, do you have a sense, uh, Wayne, of what, yeah, how, so what percentage of your students are, are voting? 
I, I would say probably around 60 percent but on, wow. the, on this issue about 18 months ago some, my students took over the building as well and so I, I'm, I'm kind of with Ron um, <laughs> th there have to be you know some guardrails and I think as you get more active I, I don't want sometimes I think our students romanticize activism yeah. you have to be educated about what it is you are protesting about and not just protesting for the sake of protesting and I think President Obama took some heat recently because he was talking about being woke and just being woke is not about just calling people out. But you must have some substance behind why you're doing that in the first place and then what you must do to follow on. And I, I, I unfortunately, I'm with him in that very lonely boat that you <laughs> must have some knowledge about why it is you want to do these things and research it, but not come to the table with me and meet with me and you don't even know you know, what the facts are, I think that that's all. And, and, and just to build a point, but the, the notion that there is at the end of the day, even when you're successful, being in a messy pluralist democracy, yeah. ultimately is about compromise. You know, it's not winner take all. And I think this in some sense, there's a, I think a simplicity to the position sometimes that really speak to the polarization in American society. It is winner take all and uh, from the perception of some of these groups. And again, what you're trying to do is use this as a teachable moment saying, it's give and take, and it turns out there may be competing values on the other side that have legitimacy and currency that ought to also be reflected in the consensus that we I achieve. I think what the, last, what the three of you just said in that last round sums up this whole conversation this morning perfectly and also just on time. So I want to thank you very much. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. That's a wrap. Thank you. I hope all of you leave here inspired by someone you met and thinking about civics in a new way. And before you dash out the door, please join me again in thanking our partners at the Stavros Nierkos Foundation Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins. We're grateful for their support. And one last request, um, you'll receive an email with a quick survey. We also have hard copies here. We'd love if you could fill those out. And just so everyone knows, we're going to have a networking reception um, right outside. So please join us um, for a little bit longer and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>